I've known, I've known Matt for a long time, I think. Yes, and he's, he's great. Uh, he is the director of precision medicine initiatives at Columbia. He's director of the neurogenetics program in the Department of Neurology at Columbia University. He's the associate director of the Eleanor and Ruth Gehrig ALS Center. He's a neurologist and neurogeneticist who's focused on finding new genetic changes that contribute to ALS and understanding how a particular genetic change results in a particular clinical picture. And today, he's going to tell us about ALS genetics, understanding the rare so we can treat everyone. Come on up. All right, so um, it's a real pr uh, privilege to be back in the Philadelphia area uh, to be talking today about ALS genetics. And um, as Terry and Lyle and I went back and forth about what to call this talk, uh, we really wanted to focus and emphasize just a couple of weeks after Tofersen was approved for a very specific, small, rare subset of ALS patients, how the types of genetics and genomic studies that we're undertaking in the rare forms of the disease are in fact poised and bringing about um, changes in how we're thinking about treatment for all of ALS, even if there isn't a genetic mutation. So my comments today will be focused on um, making sure that uh, we're tackling all of ALS, even as we're learning from these rare forms. I do a few disclosures, mainly that lots of the companies that manufacture these genetic therapies need the help of geneticists uh, to figure out how to bring them to clinic, and so I've been involved both on the research and consulting front. Uh, with several of them. So I'd like to begin today by outlining the course of human genetic understanding as it's, as it's been over time, and how that relates to the ALS historical timeline. So right here across the top of this uh, red arrow are the major discoveries that have brought us to a place where we can understand genetics. So going all the way back to 1865, when the concept of uh, P crosses could bring about um, phenotypes in those P's. But it wasn't until 1902 that we understood that probably the underlying uh, uh, component of heredity was chromosomes. It took another 50 years for us to have a sense for what the DNA that made up those chromosomes looked like and how it behaved. And then it wasn't again until 1983 that the very first human disease gene was located and mapped. Not identified, but mapped. By 2001, just 20 years later, we mapped the entire human genome, which was a tremendous amount of progress for just 20 years. And 10 years later, it was possible for around $1,000 to sequence the human genome. So in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, tremendous and uh, accelerating progress. How does that line up with the discoveries of ALS, the disease that we're all here and focused on? So 1869, around the same time as Mendel's principles of hereditary were being developed, um, Charcot uh, described ALS, and even going back to those original descriptions, recognized that there were some familial forms um, uh, predicting the fact that we would under, uh, eventually understand why that was the case. Of course, in 1941, Lou Gehrig uh, passed away from the disease. In 1993, the first ALS gene was discovered, and just a few years later, the ALS Hope Foundation itself was established. And then finally now, um, in 2023, 30 years after the discovery of SOD1, an FDA-approved medication for that specific subtype of ALS. So lots of progress over the last 50 years, but obviously so much more to go. So um, I hope you'll take some um, comfort from the fact that if I now array the ALS research publication growth across this timeline, we're on a logarithmic growth curve. Um, this year, we will pass 40,000 ALS research papers that have been published. And with each one of these, we're getting closer and closer to understanding some of those fundamental biological pathways uh, that lead to disease. But really, the turning point, and I can't illustrate it here enough, that really the growth of ALS publications was relatively small until 1993, when uh, the SOD1 gene was discovered. So all the way back in 1993, when I was graduating from, college, uh, from high school, uh, the first gene was discovered. And it was published in two separate papers, one in Nature and one in Science. 
Now there's so many genes uh, uh, discovered for ALS that you can't possibly land it in one of these prestigious journals because it's kind of old news since we discovered ALS genes. And if you depict over time how those gene discoveries have unfolded, uh, this is what the curve looks like. So just like the logarithmic phase of the ALS publications in general, ALS gene discoveries have also been uh, at an enormous increase in pace. And I think if you kind of squint, you can appreciate that there are kind of three eras of, of gene discovery in ALS. This first era required extremely large families where ALS had been passed from generation to generation and DNA had been collected on all of them. This allowed a technique called linkage analysis to zero in on the part of the genome that was responsible. And then it would often take five, 10 years of somebody sequencing that entire region of the genome to try to figure out what the mutation was that was causing it in that family. Not surprisingly, as a result of that, we were discovering less than one gene per year um, at that pace. The second era allowed us to sequence very quickly, so the very earliest forms of whole genome sequencing. That allowed us to focus on smaller families, but to kind of combine them, so families that seem similar, we could make comparisons across the genomes between those families. And that allowed us to discover genes at a rate of three per year. Now, in era three, which is the era that we're currently in, we're focusing on sporadic ALS. We're using comprehensive whole genome sequencing and combining that with statistics, as well as something called multi-omics, where you sequence the RNA and the transcriptome, as it's called, of cells to kind of understand the genome. Um, and we're still discovering ALS genes at a rate of two per year. So with the genes that we have discovered, how often do we find them in ALS patients? So we've now looked um, for definitive uh, gene contributions in more than 5,600 uh, people with ALS. These are predominantly of European descent, and shown here in the pie chart uh, is what we identified. Close to 500 individuals with C9R of 72, 73 with an SOD1 mutation, and then the numbers get smaller from there. But all told, we explain now about 12% of individuals with ALS. You'll appreciate that quite a number of genes uh, do show up, shown in the very left-hand corner are all of the ones that are extraordinarily rare. I'll point out that because of uh, most of the studies have taken place in Europe and the United States, these cohorts are heavily biased towards people of European descent. Thankfully, uh, over the last decade, people have invested in collecting DNA from underrepresented minorities and groups around the world to try to get a handle on this, and we now know that there's a lower rate of C9RF72 and a higher rate of TAR, DVP, and bus mutations in people of non-European descent. Therapy development has been moving also in these areas. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Tofersen has been approved uh, for SOD1 now for almost three, four weeks. There are clinical trials for three other of the more common gene mutations, C9RF72 with a therapeutic project from Wave Therapeutics the FUS gene with the fusion study by Ionis, and then uh, AL Spire, or AL Spire for against Ataxin 2 um, being run by Biogen. I think even more excitingly is the fact that um, a project called Silence ALS has been birthed, which allows us to develop drugs for individual mutations, not just individual genes. So you can figure out which specific mutation is present and tackle that. And we have therapies in development for TAR, DVP. And because you can develop it for specific gene mutations, you can now focus on even rarer forms, um, mutations and genes that might be present in only one individual family, which I've circled here, some of the rarer genes uh, that we're tackling with this type of approach. So um, at this point, we can identify gene mutations in 12% of people with ALS. That's more likely if you have a family history. But one in 10 people with sporadic disease also still test positive for one of these genes. But the bright side uh, is that we have therapies that are already FDA approved and are um, in development in clinical trials as well as on the drawing board for many of these genetic mutations. I think that brings me to the next point, which is uh, we're developing ALS genetic testing guidelines. And the general guiding principle of what the group has come to, and I won't go through methodologies about how we came to this, is that really the approach should be everything, everyone, all at once, which is 
kind of a movie title, I suppose. But, <laughs> but basically, the idea is that uh, gene mutations are so frequent that we should be looking for them in everyone. That it's really difficult for us to predict which gene might be present in an individual patient. And rather than going to all the expense and the very time-consuming nature of sequencing the most common one, and then if that's negative, moving on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, um, it really now makes sense for us to do them all at one time. Um, this is also important because as we've been doing that, we've recognized that there are people who have two mutations, three mutations that might be contributing to disease, uh, not just one. And if you just sequence the most common genes, you'll never know about those additional uh, possibilities. And I think the important uh, take home here is that by doing genetic testing early, that will shorten the time to a treatment if you have SOD1, uh, the tofersin drug, or to a clinical trial of the nature that I showed you in the previous slide. And as we all know, um, time is neurons, and so earlier therapy is, of course, a very important goal. Genetic testing uh, is currently free at a couple of companies. Uh, and almost always covered by Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial insurers these days. So even if those programs were to go away, I think we would still be able to get sequencing for most individuals. And as the cost comes down, even if you had to pay out of pocket, it's relatively inexpensive. I joke with my patients that it costs more to park at the Columbia garage to attend the clinic <laughs> than to get genetic testing. So I want to put in um, scale, um, in a figurative form, what this genetic testing and understanding looks like. So if we have a cohort of 100 ALS patients, uh, about 10% uh, of those will have a family history, so representing just that time. And then the rest we call singleton or sporadic ALS, uh, meaning there isn't a family history. In familial ALS, we now know that C9R of 72, SOD1, and then these other rare ones, can explain seven out of 10 of those individuals, leaving three in whom we still have to identify genes, which means we need to do additional gene discovery. In the singleton or sporadic ALS cases, we don't find as many mutation carriers, but actually the, new, the numbers are higher. So there are more people in the sporadic disease population with gene mutations than coming from those with a family history. So we have to take that into consideration. And I think what this tells us is that there are more genes that remain to be discovered. It makes a strong case that we need to continue our gene discovery efforts. So let's go back uh, to this gene discovery timeline, which I showed you at the very beginning. Why else should we discover more genes? Not just to provide explanations for people so that they know what might be running in their family or what the risk of it happening again within their own family might be. But we have learned a tremendous amount from every single one of these gene discoveries. So for example, uh, when we discovered that senataxin could cause ALS, it implicated the way that DNA coils and uncoils as a potential mechanism contributing to ALS. When we discovered TDP43 or TARDPP, we discovered that the way that RNA is processed in the nucleus is a major pathway of ALS. When we identified uh, the gene ubiquitin 2, we focused in and, and saw how important autophagy, a process of recycling is, that takes place inside of cells. Uh, PFN1 told us that the way trafficking happens up and down the axons is important, and so on and so forth. So basically, each one of these genes has highlighted key and important pathways, sometimes cluing us into ones that we hadn't thought about before. The last one that I circled is SBTLC1, which tells us that the way cells handle a molecule called sphingolipids is important. LGALSL is a galactin binding protein. We have no idea how that's related to ALS, but it's a subject of intense research. And I didn't have time to add the latest ALS gene to this, which is NUP50, which is a protein that regulates how things get into and out of the nucleus and tells us that nucleocytoplasmic transport is another pathway in which we need to be focusing. Uh, for ALS. And I hope you'll appreciate as we add each of this tiny incremental additional understanding to the pathways of ALS, we're essentially building this climbing wall where each one of the genes that we've identified is one of those tiny little handholds or footholds that's going to allow us to scale the entire wall, get, get to the top, and triumph uh, there at the summit. So ALS gene discovery actually implicates driver mechanisms that are present in all of ALS. So you find the abnormality uh, clued in by the genetics in the rare forms, 
And then almost immediately you go back to the cells of people who have sporadic disease, don't have one of those gene mutations, and discover that it's relevant there. So as you take the genes and put them into pathways, you start to build up what we call the mutome of ALS. And the mutome starts to tell us the protein homeostasis, the, well, the way cells make proteins, recycle proteins, repair proteins is really important. The way that the cytoskeleton, actually, the way that the cytoskeleton and the axonal transport molecules run things up and down the axon to allow it to do its job. The way that the DNA gets translated into the RNA in order to uh, become proteins is super important to ALS, and all of this we've learned by discovering genes. But I think this picture remains incomplete. These are great pathways for us to go after in our drug development, and they are being developed. For every single one of these, there are multiple companies developing therapies to tackle. But I think we need to continue discovering more pathways in order to have a more complete picture, and that goes back to discovering more genes. So the next uh, focus of my talk, I'd like to talk about how we're doing that. I told you when I showed you the array of gene discovery that in era one, we had big families we could focus on. In era two, we had small families that we could combine in order to get more information. And now in era three, we're working with predominantly sporadic ALS patients. And we're using something called rare variant association tests. So this is gonna get sciencey for just a second, but I promise we'll be able to follow it but don't place out or let the food coma kick in, all right? So the way this works is we want to sequence as many genomes as we can get our hands on. We want to sequence genomes of people who are on controls who don't have ALS, and we want to sequence the genomes of the cases or people who do have ALS, and this really applies to any human disease. So each one of these represents the genome of an individual patient that we've sequenced, or uh, in the blue, one single gene in the genome. And we then look across all of these cases and controls, and we realize that there's lots of variability, lots of variation in the DNA of humans. And when we um, ask a computer to identify all of the places that are different from what we expected to see, um, almost everyone will have some sort of a difference in this particular gene. And if you kind of squint and look between the cases and the controls, you'll appreciate that the proportion of people in the case category who have one of these um, abnormalities is pretty much similar to the other side. And so you'd say, look, this region of the genome doesn't seem to be related. It's the same in both the controls and the people who have ALS. But if we skew how we define a difference in the genome and use different uh, genetic definitions of what might be a bad difference versus an okay difference, we start to build up uh, harmless variants and damaging variants. And now when you look across the genome and you now ask the computer to identify those that would be damaging and those that are probably harmless, you can squint and appreciate the fact that when you look at the controls, there are only two abnormalities of the harmful kind in the people who don't have ALS and seven um, in those who do. And so this tells you that this region of the genome is part, uh, uh, part playing a, a role in developing the risk for ALS and that gives us important information. So we've been using this uh, to identify the next generation of ALS genes. Going back to the ALS gene discovery, the last 10 on that list have all been discovered by this type of method. And this goes back uh, to the ALS exome consortium, the first time that this type of a burden testing technique was used uh, in ALS or actually in any neurological disease. So we were able to amass close to 9,000 participants. Most of them did not have ALS, around 3,000 of them did. Uh, and when we did the whole genome and asked along those same lines as what I just showed you, if there were any regions of the genome that were abnormally represented in people with ALS, we discovered uh, SOD1. So if uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Sadiq had not discovered it all the way back in 1993, we would have discovered it in 2015. And we also discovered a new pair of genes, TBK1 and NEK1, which told us about the importance of innate immunity and microglia in ALS and set off an entire line of inquiry into a new pathway uh, for the disease. So that was 9,000 participants. Uh, we then took on an iteration with 11,000 and uh, didn't find any new genes, but emphasized others that we knew were important uh, from other methods. We're now undertaking uh, 27,000 participants, so the, the number has tripled since our first iteration. The groups that have contributed DNA and uh, sequencing data are shown here on the left. And although we haven't identified a new ALS gene, 
Now, if we ran it with this 27,000, we would have discovered five previously known ALS genes instead of just the one, like the first time we did it. So we're very optimistic that with even larger cohorts, we will be able to identify new ALS genes. And to help make that possible, we've adopted an open access approach uh, to the data. It used to be that when geneticists sequenced genomes, they kept it all to themselves, hoping to get more publications and to get more grant funding. But we believe that that slows down the field, right? And so we want it to be open and available to anyone who wants it. And so here at our website, atabd.org, um, any ALS researcher, actually anybody, uh, can go and look up individual genes and uh, the gene mutations that are there. We're not alone in adopting that practice. Uh, and in fact, ALS Genetics is one of the most collaborative and cohesive groups uh, out there. So we have on the books a plan for 100,000 participants. So five times what we've already uh, been done and are working on. The groups uh, shown off to the left here have all agreed to, uh, to contribute data to ALS Compute, which will take place on this massive computing infrastructure called Anvil. And then there's the plan to overlap this with a European study called Project Mine uh, in order to get to that 100,000 participants. And I really am very optimistic that with this approach, we're likely to discover five or six uh, new ALS genes um, in the next, in the upcoming year. So um, we have also been focusing on common ALS variation. And I think this is where the talk really pivots and starts to focus on treatments for everyone that are being empowered by studying these rare cases. So when you do these types of whole genome sequencing, you find all of the rare abnormalities, and that's what we've been focusing on here. But we also find common differences between humans. We don't even call them abnormalities, they're just uh, variations that make me me and you you. So when you see these common variants and you look across now hundreds of thousands of people, uh, you start to identify regions of the genome that are overrepresented um, in people with disease versus people with that. This very complicated diagram is called a Manhattan plot. And each of the buildings, those uh, upright um, uh, dots, uh, tell you how significantly associated a given region of the genome is with ALS. The very, very tallest building, you might call it one of the micro skinny buildings in New York that you know, is uh, 1,100 square feet, or uh, 1,100 feet tall, um, that's the C9OR72 gene. So it still is playing a major role even in, in these common disease association studies. But I want to direct your attention over here to UNC13A, which is present in 35% of people with ALS. Now this uh, gene difference in and of itself is not enough to cause ALS. So I don't want anyone going to Dr. Jaime Patterson's clinic or going to Dr. Ostro and asking to be sequenced for the UNC13A gene. It's a risk factor, a very minor risk factor. But we know about this minor risk factor is that it does increase the risk for developing ALS a teeny tiny little bit. But if you have two copies of this particular abnormality, there's shortened survival. You're more likely to have uh, bulbar onset. There's a slightly increased risk of having cognitive impairment with your ALS um, and of showing atrophy on uh, MRI. Why is that happening? Well, we didn't really understand until really quite recently that basically if you carry one of these uh, abnormalities, you don't have as much UNC13A protein. And if you carry two copies of the abnormality, you have even less. And UNC13A is important for maintaining the axon to the muscle and communicating at the what we call synapses. And so potentially, if you don't have enough UNC13A, uh, those parts of your neuronal system are unhealthy and more susceptible uh, to developing the LS. So why is that uh, important? Well, this all gets back to something that I hadn't covered yet, and that's the fact that everyone with ALS that isn't caused by an SD1 mutation has the same underlying problem when you look under the microscope. And that underlying problem is that TDD43, the protein there that's brown um, and clumped up, is supposed to be in the neurons, uh, in the neurons, um, in the neurons nucleus, um, as opposed to being clumped up out of the cytoplasm. And if it's not in the nucleus to do its job, and it's mucking things up in the cytoplasm, that's one of the key drivers of ALS, we think. So what do those two things have to do with each other? UNC13A and this abnormal protein that's not in the right location? Well, it's really, uh, yeah, sorry, my animation's not working right where 
Um, so basically, this is a schematic version. Healthy neuron, TDP43 in the nucleus, and very little out in the cytoplasm. Unhealthy neuron, all the TDP43 has left the nucleus and is now out of the cytoplasm. So what does that do? Well, if the TDP43 is in the nucleus, the UNC13A gene gets turned on appropriately, something called splicing, gets spliced appropriately, which leads to the normal protein and the normal amount of the protein. Whereas if you're missing TDP43 and you have those individual uh, variations that I was telling you increase the risk for ALS, then you don't make enough of the RNA. The RNA is unstable and gets degraded, and then you don't have enough UNC13A protein. So that's a lot of biology, but I'll sum up in one, one thing, and that is that we have molecules now that can go into the cells and block the abnormal splicing, which we think will increase the amount of UNC13A and undo the effects of that particular genetic mutation. So it turns out that UNC13A isn't the only place where not having enough TDP43 wrecks havoc on the way the gene gets turned on, spliced, and manufactured. I won't go into the details, but this happens for another gene called Staphylococcus 2 and probably 50 others. And the great thing about all of this is that we now have these antisense oligonucleotides that can block this from happening. And are now starting clinical trials to see if we stop the TDP43 dysfunction from impacting these particular genes. We can drive up the level of the proteins that are necessary and slow down ALS or potentially even stop it. So very exciting times. There. So um, that's focused on what to do and kind of to replace the function of TDP43, but what if we could actually push the TDP43 back into the nucleus so that it was doing its job and not clumping up out of the cell? So in a screen uh, done by a colleague of ours named Aaron Gittler, they identified that ataxin 2 actually facilitates it going in the wrong direction. So the more ataxin 2 you have, the more likely it is that your TDP43s can end up in the wrong location and doing the wrong things. That's important because ataxin 2 is also different from person to person to person. And there's a small region of ataxin 2 where if you have a few more repeats than you're supposed to have, it increases your risk of developing ALS twofold. So if we could block how that ataxin 2 gets expressed, then we would drive down the ataxin 2 protein and potentially keep TDP43 back in the nucleus uh, doing its job. So all of those that I just talked about are in clinical trials already, and are, we're hopeful will have a dramatic effect for at least some people uh, with it, sporadic illness, without gene mutations, um, in the way we usually think of it. So in summary, over the last 30 years, and this literally, May is the month that the uh, SOD1 gene mutations were published, we're now exactly at 30 years of gene discoveries. Uh, these have really galvanized a dedicated research community uh, to be interested in ALS. These gene discoveries, if I mapped it, every time a new gene gets discovered, the pace of publication goes up as more and more people are pulled into the field. I think it's also galvanized a dedicated set of industry partners who uh, now have what they would consider targets and handles to go after drug development. By our sequencing, we've been able to bring explanations, genetic explanations, to why ALS happened in your family or to you for around 15% of the people. And of course, we've highlighted and identified these very important key pathways that are central, we think, to all ALS cases, not just those who have the specific ALS gene mutations. Because of all these efforts, uh, we now have an FDA-approved therapy for SOD1 ALS. <coughs> We have clinical trials for FUS, DDP43, ataxin 2 and others. And I think even more exciting and more importantly, we've opened up avenues for understanding how those same types of technologies being developed for genetic ALS will be applicable to people who don't have an identifiable gene mutation. As we think about blocking the effects of TDP43 <coughs> deficits via statin 2 or via UNC13A or via, via any one of these 50 proteins, that we think are mis, uh, misregulated because of TDP43. And that's gonna lead us uh, to therapies that are applicable for all forms of ALS. So I hope uh, that you can appreciate how 
investing lots of time, energy, and effort into understanding the rare forms, the genetic forms of ALS, is leading to the prospect of having therapies that can treat everyone instead of just those with rare genetic mutations. I would like to thank all of the people who have contributed <coughs> as well as uh, data in order for us to carry on these studies. These are demonstrated here. And then, of course, uh, we wouldn't be able to do any of this without people who have lived with and died from ALS, uh, contributing time for our studies and DNA for our studies, um, which have really made it possible for us to uh, start to unlock these problems. So that's what I wanted to say. I hope um, you found that encouraging. We are certainly more optimistic than ever that we're on the cusp of something pretty amazing for ALS treatment.